Welcome back to the Oxford University Scientific Society in week three of Trinity Term. Our guest speaker this week is Oxford's very own Professor John Parrington. Professor Parrington is here today to talk about his new book, Mind Shift, How Culture Transformed the Human Brain. Having heard Professor Parrington's lectures on developmental biology and receptor signaling, I was amazed to learn that he also writes popular science books in addition to being a full-time researcher. With that said, I think it's time to hand the stage over to Professor Parrington. Well, thank you very much um, and thank you for the invitation to talk today. Yeah, it is kind of, to some extent, a, um, a detour from my day-to-day -day lab work. And obviously, it's a very big question, consciousness, the mind. But it's something that's interested me for a long, long time, really. So I, I saw an opportunity a few years ago to try and really develop my ideas about this and well you'll see for yourself what you think of my take on consciousness um so i think one of the things that is a big issue for anyone trying to explain consciousness in a purely materialist fashion um is this problem that goes way back to any descartes who posed this issue of how we could understand the body and the mind and i think descartes made a huge step forward when he basically said that we should understand the body the human body as a machine but he stopped short of trying to explain the mind in that way, um, perhaps because it was quite a delicate subject at the time, uh, the control of the Catholic Church, but also because we knew very little about the workings of the brain. And that, that's really given rise to an unfortunate um, split, really, um, in consciousness studies, what we call Cartesian dualism, which is this problem of, of trying to explain things in a material way, as, as we would with the rest of the body but then trying to explain you know how the incredible uh, complexity of you know um, thought human behavior um or you know all the amazing kind of cultural achievements if you manage how can we kind of reduce that to just uh, uh, a, mecha a mechanism and, and i think that's been an issue that people have tried to explain uh consciousness but they've sometimes they've ended up just bringing in an idealist notion a bit like this ghost in the machine the idea there's really kind of a little man in our brains controlling everything we do, rather than it being a, a materialist explanation that can explain everything in terms of neurons, um, brain structure, uh, which is what a materialist explanation would, would, would need to do. Um, and what I really wanted to do also in the book was to think about the issue of, um, you know, what conditions uh, individual choices, what conditions human personality, is it just a question of biology are our personalities just affected by uh, our control determined by our genes um or is there an important role for the environment is it very much that we grow up with an environment and that's what shapes the way we develop well well actually i think as most people would would would, would, would agree really it, it's likely to be very much a um combination of both biology and environment that goes into making up a human being and an individual human mind and yet, having said that, I think there are two real extremes that I've tried to go against really in the book, which is this idea that basically things all come down to biology. So, you know, there are people who are genetic determinists who would say uh, everything is really about the, the genes. But equally, th there are people who reject the idea completely that uh, biology makes that much difference. Um, the, I, this, it comes from behaviorism, this kind of blank slate view of how the mind develops, that we are really just... Uh, conditioned by our environment so I really want to try and find something that um, fought away between these two extreme positions if, if caricature just makes sense caricature positions and one thing that really started to uh, interest me from this point of view was the question of what makes us human what makes human beings different from other species and could that then affect you know how our, our minds and have developed and I was particularly uh, taken actually by an account of human evolution which is shown here um, which is basically that proto-humans started off by walking on two feet and then this freed it doesn't really show it here but freed up the hands to then use tools um, and then this eventually led to the development of uh, language and uh, the brain now what's interesting is this this idea which i think most people now would accept this is the sequence of events that it was walking on two legs that then freed up the hands to use tools, led to the development of language, and, and then brain development came from that. Many people are aware of this sequence of events as being the correct one, but I think it's less widely known that it was actually a, 
not a, a known scientist, but Friedrich Engels, who was a friend and colleague of Karl Marx, who first put forward this sequence of events. And unfortunately, his ideas were probably perhaps mainly ignored at the time. Um, and it's only more recently that it, there's been a little bit more acknowledgement of his role. But anyway, Engels was really the first person to realize that it was this walking on two feet, using tools, that led to social labor, as he called it, so interactions between human beings using tools to transform the world around them, that then triggered the development of language and then eventually uh, brain um, development uh, uh, as well. Of course, this is uh, this is all going on all at once to some extent. I mean, the brain is already starting to develop potentially when we first start to use tools, but I think language played this key role. And then we get almost like positive feedback as we develop language, as we develop tool use. This has a, a as a an impact on the brain, but then the brain development then it starts to affect those those processes. And the thing that also really enthused me in terms of thinking about um, a particular point of view of consciousness that I might uh, develop was the work of a, a Russian psychologist called Lev Vygotsky. It was influenced by Engel's account of, of human evolution, but decided to then use that to think about, well, what, how did human consciousness develop? And what Vygotsky basically said was, imagine that you know tools were central to human evolution because they allowed us to work upon the environment, that to transform the world around us. But what if words themselves can be thought of as a kind of tool? And that led him to investigate the links between um, thought and, and language. How do I get rid of that? Um, okay, okay. I'm trying to think how we do this now. Uh, let's get rid of the point there. Um, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so we'll go back to the pointer. So um, just going backwards one step. So yes, yeah, so, so what he then uh, said was, that imagine that you know words themselves can be thought of as a kind of tool. Well, that could mean that words themselves transform the brain, but both in human evolution, in, in shaping the development of the human brain, because basically once we start to use language, that has a big impact on the way that the brain develops in, in evolution but also in each individual um, person as they grow up within a human society. There's a kind of reshaping of the brain that's very specific to human beings and is all about the importance of, of language in our, in, our, in our consciousness. And essentially to say that, that to some extent, you know, thinking is, is language. There's a thing called inner speech that is the link between the kind of half-formed, unformed thoughts and, and, and the actual external language that we use to communicate with others. And, and he used all sorts of ways to, to study this in children. And, and also there was another thinker, Valentin Voloshinov, who was also working in Russia at the time. This was after the Russian Revolution, uh, back in the late 1920s, early 30s. Both of these people died tragically quite young, by the way. But in the, in the short kind of space of their lives, they developed all sorts of interesting ideas about the way that thought and language intermesh. And also very much the idea that thought is a kind of dialogue. So it's words, it's inner speech, but it's a dialogue and it has a social dimension that makes it uh, very different from, from the individual consciousnesses of, a, of, say, an animal, where there isn't this kind of role for language. Now, that, that was the basic framework, an idea that, you know, was put forward in, in, in the 1930s. So obviously a long, long time ago, you might say, well, what's the point of that? You know, that's, that's kind of an ancient history. Of course, you could say the same thing about any great thinker like Darwin. But what I decided to do um, was, was to then take this basic framework, this idea that language had transformed the brain, uh, and it was central to, to, to consciousness, to human consciousness, and then think, well, how would that actually affect the development of the brain? What evidence can we find from more modern uh, neuroscience and modern psychology to show how that kind of influence of language has affected the development of the brain, and both in evolution and also in terms of our individual consciousness? So, so I decided to look into all the latest uh, studies of looking at how neurons and, and the glial cells, so these are the often called support cells, but they seem to play a very important active roles as well as the, the nerve cells in the brain. How, um, what we were learning about the roles of neurons and glial cells uh, might uh, allow us to under, me to understand how this transforming role of language uh, in the human brain might manifest itself at the terms of cell function. And also, uh, I got very interested in the latest studies of how the role of epigenetics is, is, is it affects the way the genome is read within a human brain. So what I was basically doing was looking for distinctive uh, things that were distinct by the human brain that, 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 uh, that distinguish from that of an animal. Now, now of course, um, we, 
as, as an experimental scientist myself, I'm obviously completely aware that we can learn huge amounts about how the human brain works from studying animal models, uh, because there are obviously many cellular molecular processes that are very similar between us and animals. But I was also looking for uh, insights into what we were learning about uh, brain function that might point to differences between the human brain and and those of other species. And, and that also meant bringing in new uh, insights about, say, the role of regulatory RNAs, for instance. Um, now, that then led me, in, it leads me in the book then to see how this basic framework then can allow us to understand more about things like memory, creativity, imagination, and to see if I can identify what makes these processes different uh, in, in human beings compared to animals. Now, to some extent, that means identifying actual differences in the human brain. And there's some very interesting new findings showing that it's not so much just at the sort of basic molecular and cellular level that there are potential changes, but also the ways that uh, different parts of the brain are connected to each other, that, that, that there's been some changes there in human evolution. And also there's obviously a massive impact on, on human society uh, in, in this process. But for instance, you know, interesting new evidence that the cerebellum, the part of the brain that's usually only associated with repetitive movements, seems to have important roles in creativity and imagination in humans. And there seems to have been a reconfiguration of the connections of something like the cerebellum with other parts of the brain in humans that may be central to the way that we uh, think in a rational way and we have this amazing creativity and imagination that distinguishes humans from other species. Uh, the other thing I didn't want to leave out in my account of, of consciousness was the unconscious. Now, it, it's a kind of quite a controversial area, uh, the unconscious. But to some extent, I think most people would agree that a lot of what we do uh, you know, whether we say we're driving to, to, to work in the morning, we may be handling uh, uh, the, the car, we, we were driving along, we may be thinking about what we're going to do at work, the, an argument that we had with uh, someone the night before, what we're going to have for dinner that night. A lot of this might be happening fairly unconsciously. So in, in that sense, it's not a surprise that um, a lot of what we do is, is in, in terms of brain function is unconscious. A more controversial point of view is the one put forward by Sigmund Freud, which is that there is a subconscious mind, an unconscious mind, that affects um, our behavior in, in, in quite often unexpected ways. So repressed uh, desires, all these kind of things that Freud pointed to. Now, I have lots of issues with, with, with many of the ways that Freud formulated his ideas. I think a lot of what he said about sexuality and, and, and sexual stages is, is, is very kind of looks very naive now and, and, and quite sexist and quite conditioned really by some of the prejudices of the time. But what I did like about Freud's account was the very emphasis on the, on the dynamic aspects of, of the unconscious. And, and what I then did was to see how uh, the, 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 the ideas of Vygotsky and Voloshinov about the role of language and inner speech uh, as, as being a mediator of thought linked to you know some of what the interesting things that Freud said about the unconscious and the fluidity of the unconscious um, could, could be used to, to help develop, uh, you know, understanding of, of, the, of the unconscious aspects of, of, of human thought. And then an important, other important aspect of the book is to very much look at um, mental disorders, that, you know, whether we call these mental distress, mental disorders, mental illness. I hit upon the idea of using mental disorders because I think it's maybe a less, more neutral term than the mental illness. And, and here, I think this is particularly in the book where the two extremes that I mentioned earlier on, this idea that everything's in the genes or the idea that biology is in, unimportant and it's really all about, uh, you know, the environment and, 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 and society. And that's what is the trigger for mental disorders. I think this is the place where I really think these, these two extremes are not as useful when we come to, say, explain um, human human mental disorders because the, the more I looked into this subject the more the clearer it was there's a very complex situation here the more we try and find biological determinants for mental disorders the more that it, it becomes clear it's an incredibly complex situation there are biological determinants but they are incredibly fluid and they have a, a, a big uh, and the role of the environment is incredibly important at the same time I think it would be a major mistake to try and reduce mental illness, mental disorder to uh, this idea it, it, it's just about you know like we're blank slates and everything we do is just basically conditioning by the environment so i think there are differences between people that can explain some you know disorders like schizophrenia uh, depression 
um, and, uh, bipolar disorder. But uh, clearly, the role of the society is, is a very important one. Uh, and, and I speak as someone who's who's had tragedy of mental illness in my family. People of close members of the family have died uh, from, from depression. So I'm clear, of, very very aware of the. Uh, the distressing nature of, of mental disorder and how it can affect not just people who are affected by a mental disorder, but also other people in the family. But I wanted to try and get some of the latest ideas about the biological determinants of mental disorder, but in a kind of sophisticated way that, that also looked at um, the role of science. In particular, to look at how this, this emphasis on language and the way it shapes our brain might allow us to understand and hopefully gain insights into how we might treat mental disorders in the future. Uh, I think the other thing I wanted to do in the book, and this is not, you know, new to me, was to also to pick up this idea of what do we mean by disorder? Because it's one thing to call something a disorder, um, and, and it's a very sort of negative label, isn't it? It's all in terms of negatives, you know, what people can't do. And yeah, I think as studies of say things like autism spectrum disorder or bipolar disorder have shown actually the, the, there's a, a massive amount of potential in, in, in many people with these so-called disorders actually some of the very features that make these disorders distinctive are, are often uh, amazingly important in, in terms of uh, positive aspects of character um, and for instance i mean a, a good example is greta thunberg who on the one hand is defines herself as autistic and yet clearly uh, she sees her so-called disability as being one of the, the things that has allowed her to see further than to think some people in terms of ways to to tackle the the, the, the climate crisis. Um, a slightly weird area that that my research took me into it in writing the book was to think about um, path, psychopaths because what is it that makes a serial killer or, or a paedophile and that kind of thing. And and again, I think it was interesting to really look into the potential determinants here. And, and there are ideas that you know we can somehow identify a serial killer or, 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 or a criminal, serious criminal by by genes or by the brain function, the rest of it. And and, and it's an interesting line of investigation that there clearly seem to be differences. But but then trying to pick apart the cause of these it, 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 again, it leads us to complexity. It leads us to the to, to the idea that yeah, there may be differences between uh, serial killers and, and some other people. Uh, in terms of brain function, but very much the environment has, has helped shape these people. So I look at some of the ways these these two aspects, biology and, and environment, come together uh, in crime. But, but of course, if we want to think about crime, then we've also got to bring in the role of society. And uh, uh, kind of halfway through the book, or maybe it's a bit further in the book, I start to look at the, the way that particular uh, structure of society affects consciousness. So we can't ignore the fact we live in a class society, we live in a capitalist society. And at the same time, there's a huge amount of division in the world. There's inequality, there's racism, there's sexism, there's homophobia, there's transphobia, and, and, and there's all sorts of divisions that divide people. At the same time, um, we have struggle, we have resistance against oppression, we have resistance against exploitation. So I wanted to look at the ways in which, on the one hand, a divided class society affects our consciousness, but at, on the other hand, to look at moments in history when there's been major changes, whether it's been a, a struggle like the Black Lives uh, Movement or a revolution like the Russian Revolution or the, or the English Revolution or the French Revolution in the past, and look at what evidence we can find about how ideas change in those circumstances and how we can link that to then to the um, overall model of, of, of consciousness that I talk about in the rest of the book. Um, maybe ambitiously, I wanted to also bring in other aspects of culture because the, the subtitle of the book is how uh, you know how human culture transformed the human brain I've, I've already said that language is a key way in which our brains have become transformed compared to those of other species brains of other species but uh, and, and Vygotsky had this interesting idea that he called language a cultural tool so this idea that it's a tool that's kind of transformed our brain but clearly there is a lot more to the cultural tools than simply language. The fact we have art, we have music, we have literature. These are all major importance in terms of human society. So I wanted to look at, first of all, how the appreciation and, and the production of art uh, are affected by uh, language and, and, and the, uh, the transformation of the brain by language, but also the, the ways in which art and music and literature can speak to us in ways that say, speech alone, verbal speech doesn't do. Um, 
I also looked at science and set technology. I'm a scientist myself, so I was interested, was been interested in the development of science. And one of the often the ideas we often get is is that science is this thing separate from the rest of science. Scientists are this weird bunch of you know, nerds or, or whatever people who uh, are kind of species apart. And, and really, I wanted to try and look at scientists as just as just another form of human activity, but one in which has a has an impact on on, on our world and the world around us. It's continually transforming our world through new technologies, but also look at how scientific consciousness develops, how ideas change in terms of scientific progress. Uh, and that leads me to look at some areas like artificial intelligence. There's a chapter of the book where I look at claims that soon computers may be able to uh, think like a human, maybe even supersede uh, human thought, go beyond human thought. And I think there's, there's both kind of enthusiasm, but also fears about where this is all leading. I have to say I'm quite a skeptic because having you know, looked at the complexity of the human brain and the human consciousness, um, I, I, I'm skeptical about the idea that it would be that easy to, to mimic this uh, in a machine. That's not to say that you know, machine learning and all sorts of new directions in artificial intelligence are, are not incredibly interesting and exciting. But I think it's a big step to then say it would be that easy to then recreate some kind of conscious, rational, self-aware con consciousness through a machine, when you know just how complex uh, the brain is. Um, I also looked at other areas like religion and spirituality. You know, what's the origin? Not, not that I want to kind of explain, um, say, I, I, you know, explain religion and spirituality uh, by reducing it to, to brain function, but reducing it to neurons and glial cells and the rest of it, but to look at how religious ideas might have arisen in society, why they have their own particular appeal to this day, but also ask, you know, for a person like myself who is not religious, where do we get meaning? Where does an atheist get any sense of meaning? So to look at what we mean by uh, meaning and, 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 and um, in terms of consciousness and, and, and try and develop ideas about how you know, meaning is related to what I've, I've said in the rest of the book about uh, the role of language in, in human thought. And then finally, looking forward to the future. Um, well, of course, we can say that one of the astounding things about uh, human culture and human society is this amazing ability to produce these incredible technologies, you know, flying machines and great cities. And of course, the culture I've talked about, the great works of art, great works of literature, all this has come out of the human brain, which is is weird, giving it's, you know, it's, over, it's just over a kilogram in weight. And it's got the consistency of cold porridge, porridge this, this organ that doesn't look that, you know, remarkable. And yet out of it has come all these amazing things. But at the same time, and I look at, you know, new technologies like gene editing in, in the other books I've written, in, um, popular science books I've written. But, but of course, we do have a problem, which is that we seem to be heading for disaster. So despite all our amazing technologies, um, we, 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 you know, we've got things like climate, global warming, the, the climate change that uh, look incredibly threatening for, for the future of civilization, future of human society. So in the last chapter of the book, I try and pull together, you know, all the things I've said about human consciousness and then relate that to how we can try and forge a more sustainable, equal society in the future. And also, uh, you know, in, in a way that brings happiness and, and, and not insanity, not not uh, the kind of mental distress that unfortunately is such, such a feature uh, for many people in society, around one in four people uh, suffer from some kind of mental disorder. So how can we kind of find positive things to look forward to in, in, in future, both in terms of individual consciousness, but also in the way that we shape society uh, as a collective? Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. I'm sure all audience will be intrigued about your book and to, um, hopefully to be excited to find out more about this. So I think we'll enter into a Q&A session. Um, so at the time, may we have the first question, please? How personal choice affects the brain? That's quite a short question, but I think you can really elaborate on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the, obviously one of the, the uh, difficult things to explain in terms of consciousness is that, of course, we, we can talk about the neurons and look for, you know, evidence of how the neurons and the different parts of the brain are connected. But that's mm -hmm. still a long way from being able to explain what it means to be uh, an individual human consciousness. You know, how can I ever explain to you what it feels like to me to, you know, see an amazing sunset or fall in love or 
you know, see the birth of my baby for the first time, that kind of thing. And, and I think to some extent, we will never ever re really be able to imagine completely, you know, what it's like to be another human being. But I do think that um, the fact that language is this link between us and the fact we can explain complex ideas using language does mean that we can we can get a sense of what it means to be human. I don't think we get a sense of what it means to be a non-human, by the way, because I think the very mm -hmm. fact that language is the way that we that, that it structures our minds, our consciousness, means there's a radical difference between us and our you know pet dog or pet cat. I'm not saying they don't have you know quite sophisticated behaviours, feelings, all those kind of things, but that's quite different to being able to express that in words and language. And I think there's some really interesting stuff in terms of how an individual consciousness develops as a dialogue. So I think I think it was Voloshin who said the soul is like a kind of was it like an individual individual consciousness, like a tenant, uh, you know, lodging in the brain. We, we are as much a social construct in some ways as as we, as we are an individual. And yet, clearly, this this social construct is taking place within an individual organ, an individual brain, in a way that anchors us in our bodies and. There's some really interesting stuff about how the mind and body inter interrelate that mm -hmm. I can only just touch upon. But I, I, it's a very interesting question about how you would explain that individual side of consciousness. And, and I think, you know, also the interesting thing is when I look at the uh, literature or music or, or, or art, to some extent, this is also about trying to make that bridge from individual to individual. You know, I, I, through a great work of art, I, I can kind of, commune with the rest of humanity really in, in participating in that, or music or literature or whatever so there are there are ways to kind of link our individual consciousnesses just a follow-on question do you reckon that language or perhaps english or whatever language we speak limit our ability to be able to explain others yes i think that's definitely true because um in the process of turning our individual thoughts into external spoken speech or written you know literature there's always to some extent um a, a limitation on the what i'm trying to say is in a speech i mean it's very difficult to study in a speech course because it's not as soon as you try and express it you in it in you're almost it, it ceases to become inner yeah it becomes external speech I think what we've learned from studies of inner speech, and, and Freud's work actually is quite important here, actually, is there's a fluidity to thought, there's a kind of fluidity to that inner speech that is really interesting because it, 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 it means that things that we try and then express through words are, are only a pale reflection of the kind of true complexity and um, intensity of thought, yeah. But, but that's our only way to try and communicate those ideas, so that's why language remains key but like i've said you know there are other ways to communicate besides language music and art are, are, are other ways yeah. yes to bridge a cultural barrier and a question related to that does speaking a different monotone affect the way we think so speaking in a monotone speaking in a different mother tongue so for oh, example someone tongue, yeah. Yeah. spoke french as they grew up or compared to someone who speaks english yeah, that's a, that's that is an interesting question. Isn't it? I mean, I, I I kind of speak some of the languages very badly. I should say, my wife's Portuguese, so I've learned all the Latin languages to a very kind of low level. But mm -hmm. I, I find it incredibly interesting in a way how different languages, you know, like Chinese or, or, or Russian or, 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 or the Latin languages uh, or, or, or Anglo-Saxon, you know, there are quirks within those languages that I think must affect the way we see the world, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting to think, you know, what difference does it make if you're German? You know, the fact that you, you know, your auxiliary verb occurs at the, was it at the end of the sentence? I can't remember. There's something different, isn't there? And, and, and that, yes. uh, that, that, you know, or, or, or the way that say Chinese and English are really quite different in, in the structure, the grammar structure, all these kind of things. Um, so yeah, I think it must have an impact um, because because if a language is so central to, to thought, then it, it, you know, the structure of language also influences that. But ultimately, all languages, you know, are as complex as each other in, in allowing us to express ourselves in, 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 um, in, in, in a proper and expressive way. There'll be differences, but that's the human thing we share. You know, all languages we, we, we share. That. And, and of course, grammar is this very important thing that structures our language, it, 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 our, our thoughts. It allows us to have an idea of past, present and future, me versus you you know distance all these things all languages give us this ability to express those conceptual uh, thoughts about the world 
indeed there must be something in common with all of them but i think we should move on from the language topic so i can see many questions in the comment section could we have one of those please since we have the apparent ability to decide one course of action versus another does free will exist well this is a big question mm, absolutely <laughs> now, these are unanswerable questions in many ways I and mean, one of the weird things about the unconscious aspects of how the brain works is there's now evidence showing that um the, you know the neurons in our brain are already engaging in the activity that we'll will uh will engage in before we're even aware of that which obviously challenges this whole idea about what we mean by 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 free will and i i think one of the things we can say about being an individual in any particular society is that clearly we are constrained in many ways by our situation mm -hmm. society um, our, our biology to some extent, it has an influence on, on our personality, all these kind of things, what's possible. Um, but I think one of the exciting things of looking at social change and social movements and revolutions is how much ideas can change in those circumstances. So yeah, for most of our lives, we may feel that we have very little uh, free will, you know, we, we're kind of constrained in, in, in many ways in our lives at what we were able to do but clearly in certain circumstances of, of major social upheaval, all sorts of unexpected things happen. You know, you know, like for instance, when the capitalist economy was, was really first came to the fore in the English Revolution of 1642 to 49, made, they called it the world turned upside down because the changes at that time revolutionized the way that society was, was, was structured, the way that interaction between people. And I believe that had a massive impact on, on people's ideas as well. So in that sense, you know, depending on the circumstance, depending on the, the kind of the, the, the speed of, of social change, ideas and to some extent free will can change. What's possible can change, yeah. Right, that's a very interesting answer. It feels that we've constructed a box for ourselves and yet we can always try to step out of it. Can we have the next question, please? Professor Parrington, thank you. That's very nice. In light of your understanding of humans, human consciousness, what role does imagination play in human cognition? Well, I think it plays an incredibly important role because, I mean, as at one point I argue in the book, of course, rationality alone doesn't really explain the amazing uh, range of, of, you know, great technologies, great, great uh, artistic uh, and uh, you know, great works of art and literature and the, and the rest of it. So clearly imagination, creativity are uh, quite central to our, the way we can change from generation to generation in terms of society and all the amazing new technologies and cultural tools and all the rest of it. Um, but, but I think I would also say that this imagination, creativity is central to what makes each individual uh, have massive potential really. So one of the things that Vygotsky was very keen on was stressing the amazing potential in each person really. His, his idea, for instance, uh, you know, testing in education was that there was a real danger in labeling people as only, a, a, you know, able to accomplish a certain amount. They, 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 you know, they were, they were almost like intelligence was like a, a bucket of water and that certain people had a level that was higher than others, but we were all constrained by these kind of things where he, he developed kind of ways to try and enhance the the creativity, imagination of children of all, you know, different abilities and, and, and whatever. And, and I think one of the things that's quite exciting about new findings about the, the way that the brain works is, is to realize that, you know, the, the way that the, the human brain has developed compared to that of an animal is, is through kind of radical transformation of the connections between different brain regions. And this seems to be central to imagination, creativity. The cerebellum, as I said earlier on, plays a key role. But I think it also means there's a dynamic aspect to, to human beings that means that we all have a potential to develop in some quite amazing ways in terms of creativity and imagination, given the opportunities, given the chance. But of course, that raises issues then about social access and, and all of these different things. Is there a way to encourage children to perhaps get better at imagining things or coming up with developing their creativity? Is Actually, that one of the things that Vygotsky did study quite a bit and he, and he had some interesting ideas about was the role of play. So he saw play as being actually central in the development of creativity and imagination. Um, and of course, one of the, the problems that we have in a lot of educational today is that there seems to be more and more emphasis on 
just learning and, and, and not and less on play. You know, so there's even like schools uh, I've heard about that have been, you know, a limited play time. And, and, and I think that even as an adult, you know, we don't have enough playfulness in our lives often. One of the interesting things about hunter-gatherer society is how work and play are completely combined. Really. I'm not trying to say these are ideal societies. Obviously, they had all sorts of kind of material problems. They didn't have modern medicines and, or any of that. But in general, that kind of emphasis on the role of play has been an important part of all aspects of life. It's something we might learn from. And, and, and I th so I think definitely encouraging play in children. And, and, and you know, and also, um, I think sometimes you need quite radical measures to encourage children to, 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 to develop their imagination. So, you know, the idea that we should just have the emphasis on learning, you know, literature by rote, for instance, learning texts and things like that. My daughter seems to spend a lot of time learning texts, you know, for English literature. I think that there should be much more emphasis on um, the kind of the imaginative process that reading a text like a, like a novel uh, you know, as a story, thinking of the sort of storytelling aspects of human society. And yeah, if that makes sense. <laughs> Does there come a point where you think um, this kind of play aspect of developmental science doesn't work anymore? So is there a set point up, up until which you can develop an imagination or can you develop it all your life? Yeah, interesting. I mean, I, as, as an academic, someone who's, who's always, you know, had a very kind of um, I mean, I've done well at exams. You know, I got to Oxford, Oxford in the first c case from from a, from a non-academic family. You know, I was the first in my family to go to university. Mm -hmm. Clearly, I've benefited hugely from structured learning, from you know, uh, reading and, and and quite abstract thought. You know, all all these kind of things. All, all this is an important of how I work as a scientist. But I do think there is a role for creativity and imagination in science as in the arts. And, and I think often with our emphasis on, um, you know, end-driven, you know, um, work, you know, having a goal, I think there is a danger that in scientific research now, we're often expected to um, say, you know, what, what's the end of all this? What, what's the point of all this? What drugs is it gonna create? What medicine? And actually, if you look at some of the more radical scientific discoveries, like for instance, gene editing, CRISPR, um, mm -hmm just been awarded the Nobel Prize to women, Jennifer Dowden and Emmanuel Charpentier. And my second book, Reads and in Life, was, was about that. Actually, it, it was initially very much curiosity-driven science, really. And, and I think that kind of sense of playfulness about research, for instance, is key. And, and again, with, with the arts, you know, if, if, if it's just about producing a product, a film or whatever, I think there's a danger of stifling that kind of creativity that, that is central, I think, to all of all human progress really right so i think your point is that we can encourage creativity at all um, periods in life i think we should move on from this conversation and have a different question so have a next question please right does language limit or expand consciousness by reducing experience in favor of imagination oh this is combining the two topics i'm talking about <laughs> yeah i mean as i said before in a way trying to express anything in language to some extent, limits limits. Mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Yes. it will never be as as complex and as fluid and as uh, as thought. Interesting in a way, if you think about the dream process, dreaming is a sort of sense of how you know fluid and weird kind of inner thought can be. Actually, and of course, there's always that possibility that there's an element of repression there, uh, and not really facing up to some of the desires and 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 and, and uh, thoughts that, that would, some people might find kind of quite weird and and, and wacky, really. But uh, but I think ultimately language is the only way that we can communicate with each other uh, in terms of kind of rational you know concepts mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But but like I said, there's there's other ways to do it. You know, music, literature, all these are all ways to communicate with other people. I, I think often great literature is 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 going back to this point about how can we ever know another individual consciousness. To some extent, great novels are allowing us into the into the heads of another person out there, they're, they're through storytelling, through, through, through character development. We, we do learn something about what it means to be another kind of person, or through a film, you know, through a great film, um, or through a song. So, so I think there are all sorts of ways in which we can bridge those gaps that language alone, language alone, yeah, it, it is limited, but there's so many other ways to communicate besides language, but are equally human and are equally unique to, to our species. Right, I think we'll move on from that and have the next question. 
Oh, this sounds quite long. Um, to what extent does language cause negative consequences in the development of cognition? Are there any aspects of language that can be changed to minimize these negative consequences? I, mean, I think one thing that's interesting about Voloshinov's idea of, of inner speech and, and thought, really, was that there is, there is a dialogue going on in our minds. Um, you know, we, we grow up through language. We, we, we initially start off life as with an unstructured conscious, something probably similar to that of an animal in a sense. A baby without language doesn't really have any means to express itself apart from in the most, you know, um, I guess animal-like ways. But, but as soon as language starts to change our consciousness, from that point on, to some extent, yeah, we are constrained by our thought becoming bound by language. Now, now the interesting thing about it being a dialogue is that the influences in our in our lives from others, from peers, from teachers, from parents, whatever, in a way creates our individual consciousness. You know, you could almost argue that you know our inner speech is to some extent uh, is massively influenced by all the in interactions we've had in our life, you know, up to this particular point. Um, but there's a dynamic aspect to it, I think, that's really key. And, and I think because it is a dialogue, there's room for argument, there's room for discussion, there's room for even changing ideas. So clearly some people can be very stuck in their ideas. But again, going back to what I said about social movements, one of the interesting things is how radically ideas can change in some circumstances. And, and, and that has implications for society because it means that what was thought of as impossible or, or unnatural or, or not right can ideas can change i mean look at the way that ideas about homosexuality or, 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 or transsexuality have changed over recent decades that that is a sign uh, or, or about racism for that that is a sign of how ideas can change and that to me involves the change in that kind of dialogue that's going on in the in the individual mind now of course the unconscious mind plays a massive role you know we can think about things like un unconscious bias there are real mechanisms in the brain that I think help to keep us in that state of being afraid of others, suspicious of others, uh, prejudiced against others. But there's also a possibility to challenge those, 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 those kind of mechanisms as well. And one of the things I look at in, in my book in terms of social movements is looking at how connections between different parts of the brain, like the amygdala, which is, you know, tends to be linked to more like fear and pleasure, those kind of more basic emotions. And, and areas like the prefrontal cortex that we associate more with kind of rationality and, and complex thought, the, 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 link, the, the interactions between those different parts of the brain, I think, can change. And, and society and, and changes in, in our social interactions can, can, can affect that. Right. That's a very interesting answer. Go for the next question, please. Oops. In what time scale can language affect the development of the human brain? Okay, so to some extent, the human brain has, has radically changed because of language over millions of years. So, so it's, there's still a lot of you know, debate and discussion about when language originally arose in human beings. But mm -hmm. to some extent, we, we're learning that tool use and language is probably a lot more ancient than, than some people have, have realised. So there's been this process of language and using tools to transform the world around us influencing brain development going back to our proto-human ancestors you know back to homo erectus and you know australopithecines you know as early as that really so in that sense it's part of our biological makeup part of our genome reflects these changes i believe and, and in fact one of the things i try and do in the book is to find evidence that that the human brain has radically changed not just in the size because clearly it is a lot bigger than you know for, 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 for than it should Other be primates. for a typical primate but but also in this change in in the um even at the most basic molecular and cellular level i think as well now of course then you've got growing up within a particular human society as we grow up within society that does affect the development of our brain because the other thing we were learning about how the brain works is it's very plastic it's, it's the neuroplasticity seems to be a key feature of of, of the brain in general but particularly of the human brain there seems to be something that is if you see a chimpanzee brain versus a human brain development, there's massively, there's much more plasticity in, in human brain. And so that means there's this, this, this is potential for uh, social interaction to affect the way our brains develop in, in all sorts of interesting epigenetic uh, ways, for instance. Right. Um, it's quite interesting to understand how perhaps we have 
had language for a very long time and how that links in with being um, the brain being plastic. Right, so could we have the next question, please? Openness of mind and how can it be built? Well, I guess the openness probably means um, the, the ability to accept new ideas, perhaps something like that, or maybe um, our audience would like to expand on this further. I think we'll just discuss it and yeah, see. Yeah, fine, absolutely. I mean, I to some extent, what I've said already about the way that ideas can change uh, is is important to this. I mean, Antonio Gramsci was a political thinker, an Italian political thinker, who said that people have a contradictory consciousness. They can have ideas, uh, the most reactionary ideas, coexisting with some quite progressive ideas, for instance. You know, that, that can be true of anyone to some extent that we may have all sorts of prejudices and things but quite sophisticated quite more advanced ideas as well and to such extent to some extent this is a balance this is affected by the shape of society around us what's seen as possible what's seen as acceptable and that's why when when, when we have social change it can have a big impact on um on, on our minds partly because you know any kind of social movement any major social movement, any kind of revolution for that matter involves a massive amount of discussion um people debating discussion. i mean I, I i was involved in the ucu strikes uh, a couple of years ago oh, right. yes. and okay. what was interesting there was some of the ideas being traded on the picket line it, it started off as a dispute purely about pensions and salaries but uh, out of that kind of strike and that the sort of discussions you had as part of the strike people start to question you know things like you know the impact the gender imbalance in terms of uh, you know, secure jobs in the university, the people at the top, uh, you know, all, all sorts of ideas about, you know, governance structures, all sorts of things. So it's interesting how once that process of debate and discussion starts to develop, it, it can escalate, it can go in all sorts of interesting, more general directions. And that must have an impact, I think, on consciousness without a doubt, because if consciousness is a dialogue, that external dialogue also impacts our internal dialogue. That's definitely true. I think our audience has just came back with um, his reply um, and he's talking about the ability of us to learn. How does this, how can this be built? Yeah, one of the interesting things about the human brain is how much more open it is to learning. Now, one of the interesting things about becoming bipedal, so the fact we started walking on two legs, mm -hmm. was that this then became actually quite a problem because women, you know, walking on two legs have, have a smaller hips, you know, you need that to be able to walk on two legs. At the same time, the, the human brain was developing, was evolving, it was becoming bigger. So you've got the problem that women need to give birth, but, but to, with it, with the smaller hips, to um, smaller sort of pelvises, to to, uh, to babies with bigger brains, and that's a, a big problem. You know, that, that's why, not that I would ever know, birth is incredibly painful and excruciating, and some that, you know, it can be quite life-threatening for, for women uh, still to this day. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways around that problem was, 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 was to for human beings to be born much earlier in terms of brain development. So already, already it's an issue that the brain is, is big to come out of that the pelvic canal. But that means that human beings are born um, much more, uh, much kind of, we're almost like we're premature in a sense, we're born prematurely. Now that mm -hmm. means that there's much more possibilities for learning because the brain is still developing at a time when we've got that social interaction going on. And, and actually that's extended even into adulthood. So for instance, um, the plasticity of the brain that you would find in say chimpanzee tends to have already come to an end by adolescence uh, whereas in a human being it can continue in, until the late 20s there's still major changes going on in terms of the plasticity of the brain and all this means that there's a, a major potential for um the brain being influenced by society and by social change and having said that i don't think it even ends at you know in the late 20s there's increasing evidence that you know neurogenesis this process where new neurons can be formed in the brain is something that can occur throughout life and, and i think that's quite exciting because it means, on the one hand, it means that, you know, there's potential for changing ideas because of this neuroplasticity. But also, hopefully, if we want to try and tackle some of the disorders like uh, hunt, uh, like um, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, there is potential there to harness that kind of plasticity, hopefully, through drugs. Hmm. It's quite interesting to see how we're coming back to um, my familiar 
section of um, knowledge about biology. Um, <laughs> but for now, we'll have probably two more questions, and I'm afraid we'll have to end there. So the penultimate question, please. Is it expected that modern communication technologies, such as the internet, will modify the way we think or the structure of the brain? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, this is a controversial area because, I mean, of course, you could you could just see the, the kind of positive or the negative sides of the internet. I mean, there's definitely evidence that one, one of the person that influenced me when writing the book was somebody called Earl Miller, who's been developing these ideas based on his, on his studies of uh, primate brains about how brain waves of different frequencies can interlink different brain regions and this is very dynamic and i in the book i argue that language has probably transformed this process as well but this this role of different brain frequencies seems to be key but he's also looked at working memory and he's shown that if you have too many inputs if you have a barrage of information coming in all the time you imagine your 24 7 news reel or your or your or your you know or your, your TikTok videos or your, or, or your Facebook or your email messages, all this can have a potentially detrimental effect on, on the brain because our brains are not really geared to this kind of continual barrage of information. So that's the kind of negative side of it. I, I think there are mm -hmm. things we need to think about in terms of how that might affect, you know, um, the mind, you know, there's increasing evidence of, of mental disorders in, in young people. Is this linked to the internet? Is it, you know, is this continually being... Uh, on, on display, visible, you know, all sorts of issues about body image, that kind of thing. But I think that there must be also a very positive side to the internet as well. I mean, you know, the fact we're having this discussion, you know, through the internet in itself is <laughs> an amazing thing, really, isn't it? And and I think in, in general, if we handle these new technologies carefully and, and we realise some of the dangers and the ways they can be abused and, and the way they can, they can destabilise uh, minds and, and cause distress, Clearly, I, I think there's all sorts of potential ahead. And, and actually, one of the areas that Lev Vygotsky was particularly interested in was, in terms of education was um, working with people with learning disabilities. And, and, and certainly in terms of mental disabilities and physical disabilities, I think the potential for using the internet to overcome some of the, uh, the problems that can come from mental or physical disability, um, it, it, massive potential really. But, but yeah, it's, it's a very double-edged sword. And, Someone kind of needs to write a book, I think, really about, you know, these, <laughs> they're almost, I think I need to write a sequel to this book, looking into the <laughs> ways in which these different cultural tools uh, influence our minds, but how it's changing in the future. And I do it to some extent in the book. Right. Well, if you do happen to write a sequel, we'll be very much interested to see what you come up with. Right. One last question, and then we really will have to go. <laughs> what is empathy? And I would like to add, how does it connect to the idea of us talking about understanding someone else's consciousness? Fascinating question, yeah. I mean, of course, when I do admissions interviews in medicine, we, we always ask the mm -hmm. students, uh, you know, things that are supposed to demonstrate their empathy because, of course, you want a doctor who can empathise, don't you? That's an important thing. I, I mean, I think, obviously, the, the fact that we can, we are connected by language, we are connected by these other cultural tools, means that... We, we ought to be able to try and imagine what it's like to be another person, to try and what, imagine what makes them uh, unhappy or, or, or in pain or, or, or distressed or whatever. Of course, there are elements of society where we see people who seem to lack any kind of empathy. You know, I mean, I look in the chapter in my book about crime and punishment, about serial killers. Now, clearly this seems to be people who, you know, delight in, in pain of others they seem to have no ability really to to really empathize with with the pain and suffering of the people that they they harm uh, and, and that raises all sorts of questions about what might be different about their brains but i think more generally one of the problems we face in a, in a very divided society a class society is the way that um decisions that affect either individuals you know like sacking someone because you need to restructure an industry or or or, or, or more generally like let, let let's not bother about the impact of, of a technology on the environment you know if, if i can make a profit then i'm going to go ahead despite the fact that's going to potentially lead to the disaster of, of you know global warming um sea levels rise and all the rest of it so so clearly the way that society is structured the division society have an impact on 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 our ability to empathize or, or in, in the sense that somehow the bigger picture becomes lost really and i think one of the important things in, in a way what i tried to do in the last chapter of the book was 
to try and look to the future and think, well, if we, how can we create that sustainable future? How can we create society that's more equal, more just, but also one that's not heading for disaster? And I think that, in a way, means we need more connection. We need to think more about how we're all connected together. You know, we're all in this together, like we've learned through the pandemic. You know, it's not good mm -hmm. to let a virus kind of rip through human society. It affects us all. But, but, but and something like climate change, I think we can see how, I mean, most people seem to be aware now of the fact there's a problem. But actually, when it comes to the major decisions in terms of stopping that direction that we're in, that's leading us to disaster, there seems to be some problem in, in, in kind of acting. So, so that's maybe not really answering the question really, but, but empathizing means being aware of others, people as individuals and, and, and as, and as but also as we're all connected together, you know, we're all, we're all this unique species. We've got so much to gain from working together, using our amazing abilities, of, you know, developing, to develop new technologies, culture, art, the rest of it. But we're, it's only going to really work if we work as a society and as, as a kind of collective. Um, and that means, I, I guess, empathy has to extend across the human race to extend that we're all, we're all this in together to, it, to, it, to a big extent. That's a well, very think, that's kind of hand waving answer, but anyway, that's the best I can do. Well, I think that is the perfect note for this conversation to end on. So I'm afraid that is all the time we have for questions. If you would like to learn more about this topic, please do check out Professor Parenting's book, Mind Shift. Thank you to everyone who tuned in today, wherever you might be. Thank you to the Scientific Society Committee members for making this possible in such a busy term. And thank you to our guest speaker today. And we wish you all the best with your book and as well as your future endeavors. Next week, on Thursday at 5 p.m., we'll be hosting Mr. Herbert Swanaker from Clifford Chance, and he'll be talking about the implications of artificial intelligence on the practice of law. Hope to see you there, and enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thank, Thank you very you. much.